Welcome, everybody. I'm Walter Isaacson, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to the 11th annual Aspen Ideas Festival. <laughs> Since the inception of this festival, David Bradley and I have had the high honor of giving these welcoming speeches. Uh, this was initially a very simple affair. David would tell his joke about the person who parked at the White House and locked the car door. I would say a lot of kind words about Kitty Boone, and that was it. But then an evolution occurred. David's speeches became funnier and much more elaborate. They involved not only well-polished jokes, but they involved bears and flip charts and costumes and wry humor and ersatz analysis. They sort of became a cross between a Renaissance court pageant and a Booz Allen client presentation. <laughs> Indeed, it soon came to pass that one of the high points of Aspen Ideas Festival, along with the hot dog stands, was David's talk. So, you know, the glow from his countenance was such a light that it was like uh, a particular type of talk. And just as there were TED Talks, we soon had David Talks. <laughs> In fact, like TED, we franchised them around and had David X Talks. And that's how we invented such new stars as David Rubenstein and David Brooks. They all became part of the David Talk <laughs> series. But that left me with a dilemma, lacking David's intimate and innate dazzling self-deprecation and his Will Rogers wisdom and his dozens of researchers, speechwriters, and focus groups. <laughs> I would toss and turn the night before and try to figure out what I was going to say. I began to feel like the guy who got to spin plates and talk to Topo Gijo before the Beatles came on stage on the Ed Sullivan Show. A few months ago, a solution to my dilemma appeared miraculously in the inbox of my email. Magically, like an email informing you that you have $10,000 waiting for you in a Nairobi bank account. <laughs> it was an email from David Bradley saying, let's not do our opening speeches this year. My immediate reaction was elation. Uh, it would be one less time in my life where I would feel like the runner-up on a reality TV show. But then a thought occurred to me. I would be happier, but everybody else would be disappointed. People came from miles around, from many goodly states and kingdoms came, and they came for two reasons. One was the hope of being invited to Linda Resnick's dinner party, and the other was to hear David's opening speech. Now, this year's there's no Linda Resnick dinner party, and if we didn't have David's speech, I feared people wouldn't come back. So I declined David's ceasefire offer. Instead, I'm gonna revert to a coping mechanism I developed over the past few years. Instead of trying to compete with David, I tried to, uh, with a small modicum of seriousness, to talk about whatever idea I've been working on or thinking about in the past year. One year I spoke about balance, the next year about civility, then about humility. It wasn't exactly competing with David Bradley, but at least I was beginning to sound a bit like David Brooks. Um, <laughs> so this year I've got another idea, a little idea I want to extol, which is curiosity, curiosity for its own sake, and being part of something larger than ourselves. I've been studying and looking at the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci. And like a good ideas festival, Leonardo connects art to science. And in the Codex Lester, the one that Bill Gates bought for millions and millions of dollars, uh, he wrote a very simple question, which is, why is the sky blue? Now, this is a phenomenon we all see every day. You know, go outside, it's an amazing phenomenon. But most of us are no longer curious about it. As a child, we probably asked the question one day. We probably got a mumbo-jumbo answer or something we didn't quite understand. 
And then we went on to some other deep mystery that might be puzzling us, like, I don't know, what came first, chocolate milk or chocolate ice cream? <laughs> but Leonardo, throughout his life, was curious about it. The air is absolutely clear, so why is the sky blue? He gets close to the answer. The blue color is caused, he writes, by moisture that vaporizes in particles and is hit by the sun's rays. His quest was inspiring. Leonardo did not need to know why the sky was blue. He could paint the Mona Lisa without knowing. But in a deeper sense, he did need to know. He was curious. And he realized, as he said, that there was a beauty manifest in the laws of the universe. And the ability to marvel at such beauty is a form of spirituality. It's what makes us human. Humans are the species that is capable of being curious about why the sky is blue. His curiosity in the Codex Lester struck me because I had actually seen that question before, and I'd done a double take when I saw it before. It's Albert Einstein who asked himself, not as a child, but as a 32-year-old, exactly why is the sky blue? And in 1911, building on the work of Leonardo, he calculates the detailed formula for the scattering of light by molecules. He did this not because it would be useful. He and Leonardo could have just done just fine like we do in our lives, not really knowing why the sky is blue. They did it because they realized that they were part of phenomena that are larger than ourselves. We often emphasize the utility of ideas, that they're practical. We proclaim how important it is to turn them into something practical. Ben Franklin did that when he, after the first year of his electricity experiments, he lamented that they had discovered a lot of things, but they had found no practical use for this electricity. He said that the only practical use they had found so far, because he'd been shocked a few times and knocked down, was that electricity tends to make a vain man humble. <laughs> um, but that, after flying his kite in the rain, he conceived of the lightning rod, which was the most useful invention of that era. We like to judge our ideas festival sometimes, like our universities and our schools, by how useful the impact is. That's one reason we hold an action forum later in the summer, to encourage our network of young leaders to do something useful and practical with our ideas. That's why we have a section of our magazine and a part of our website called Impact. So when General McChrystal comes here and says that everybody should have an opportunity to serve the country, we start a project to create service year cores, where we discuss urban uh, innovation. And then Phyllis Taylor, Bob Steele, helps us create an innovation lab at the, U at the um, Institute. We like to show we can have practical consequences. But this week, we should also remember that it's important to relish ideas to wonder about them, to marvel at them, ranging from the beauty of math to the future of cities, simply because we are curious about them, a pure curiosity, a curiosity that may have no direct utility to our daily tasks once we come down from this mountain. It's a type of curiosity we all got to indulge as kids. Some of us got to indulge it at colleges before colleges became places that felt they had to emphasize utilitarian and useful skills. That's what made Leonardo special. It's what made Einstein special. As Einstein once wrote to a friend, I have no particular talents. I'm only passionately curious. And he also emphasized that that curiosity was good, not just because it might lead to something useful, but it had a value of its own. Curiosity, he wrote, has its own reason for existing. Exactly 100 years ago this week, the very end of June of 1950, Einstein traveled to Göttingen, Germany, to explain for the first time a new theory he was working on. It actually became the most beautiful theory in the history of science, the general theory of relativity. His theories led to many practical things. His fingerprints are on almost anything practical we have in our lives today, semiconductors, microchips, GPS, space travel, atomic energy, lasers. But his curiosity was not motivated just by a desire to help create smartphones or space shuttles. He was driven, he said, echoing Leonardo, by a desire to understand the spirit 
manifest in the laws of the universe. And as he wrote a friend just before he died, quote, never cease to stand like curious children before the great mystery into which we are born. And that should be our mission, your mission, all of our mission this week. Indulge in your curiosity, not simply because it may lead to something useful, but because it might allow us to stand again like curious children before the great mystery into which we were born. I have one other example I would like to cite about the underlying value that leads to curiosity. And that, as I said, is caring about something larger than yourself. In this week's New Yorker, Lawrence Wright has a story about the families of five hostages taken in Syria and their wrenching struggle to save them. It begins at David Bradley and Catherine Bradley's dinner table. And David turns out to be the hero of the tale. With the FBI and the State Department and the White House all feuding and flailing around a bit, David Bradley took matters into his own hands, something most of you wouldn't know. Never talked about it, never sought publicity, never gave interviews about it. He invited the families to work with him. He hired, with his own money, investigators and staff and people to go to the region to try to track down. He lobbied the government agencies. I remember watching him walk from the White House. I just happened to bump into him. And there he was on one of the many missions trying to get the families together to devise strategies and to try to get people in different governments to help. He did it quietly, combining focus with compassion in a way that was inspiring and is the opposite of what sometimes happens in our government or even in our lives. And four of the cases, as we unfortunately know from the gruesome beheading videos, the efforts were not successful. But David made a difference. And because of his work, the way the government handles hostage situations has now been changed. But he also made a difference to the families personally. Art Sotloff, the father of one of the beheaded hostages, was so upset at the way the government handled things that he even refused to accept a condolence call from the president. But he did ask, and Catherine and David got on a plane to do it, to fly down to Miami and to sit shiva with his family. The one thing Lawrence Wright failed to do in his article is to figure out what drove David Bradley. Just this last Monday, David and Catherine had the hostage families over yet again to their dining room. And in the article, what motivated David remains somewhat of a mystery. You know, was he a desire to be a red? Did he want to play a public role? For some reason, even though Lawrence Wright is a good reporter, he couldn't quite figure it out. There were a few quotes in the article, one from Catherine about David's compassion, another about an Atlantic media freelancer had been caught, or the fact that James Foley had once written a second thank you note. But he basically paints David as an enigma. Some of us who know David and admire David, at times when we first met him, thought he was a bit of an enigma. But we understand, and we've come to understand, how deep his values are and how deep his commitment is to act on those values. He has a lively curiosity. He's always asking, explain this to me. But his curiosity is rooted in caring about things larger than himself. And that is why I think he felt compelled to help a group of hostage families he had never met. And that's why I'm proud to have him as a friend and our partner. David Bradley. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think that concludes this year's Aspen Ideas Festival. Thank you for coming. So we all value Walter's words. Um, and you'll understand how much those words mean to me. Um, thank you very much, Walter.
So this is my 11th year um, with you. How many of you have been here? Uh, we're here at the beginning. So good number. We've, we're growing old by the decades together. Um, and this is, for me, the 11th time at this podium. Um, I am in my 11th year of not having a big idea. I, <laughs> I, I don't mean that with false modesty. I don't have a big idea. I don't have a medium-sized idea. I don't have an original idea. I don't have a good idea. And so I walk around the Aspen Ideas Festival as this kind of idea-free zone, just blinking as I see everybody. <laughs> and that's why I've developed stories. I thought, well, okay, let's, let's tell stories. And some of them have been, uh, well, they're all a mix of fact and fiction. Some have been much more fact. The bear story was based on uh, real bear attacks in Colorado. Last year's uh, story about uh, the campus erupting in a marijuana party was, was entirely fiction. Um, so, uh, three weeks ago, Catherine and I were on vacation together for a week, and I sat down and I wrote out a story. Uh, and the story was 100% fantasy, 100% fiction. Here's, here's the conceit of it. Um, I was going to tell you, uh, especially those who had just arrived, that there was a new security concern here in Aspen. Um, that is that uh, Snowmass, our sister village, uh, has just recently fallen to ISIS. I was going to comment that the administration in Washington called it a tactical setback. <laughs> and then I was going to pivot to what I was thinking of as uh, the good news, that um, the caliph of the Islamic State, al-Baghdadi, um, had just announced uh, in Snowmass the first annual ISIS Ideas Festival. <laughs> and you can see where the humor would go from that. Um, I had our own Damien Wetzel up there leading the open ceremony in light exercise. I had Ruth Bader Ginsburg dropped by the taxi at the wrong, wrong festival. <laughs> and spending her whole time trying to explain her vote on the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> while all ISIS wanted to do was admire her beautiful black robe. <laughs> I even designed an Aspen idea, excuse me, an ISIS ideas pass, like you all are wearing. This, this is it. Um, <laughs> So this went on at some length, and then, I wasn't gonna reference it directly, but Walter put it on the table. Kath and I spent time with the hostage families, um, and that's a, that's a wrenching experience. And then all of us just read about the ISIS attack in Tunisia and France and Kuwait, and the story just wasn't, wasn't in me anymore. I don't know if it was, if it was funny, um, but it wasn't funny anymore. So I simply bailed. Yesterday morning when I read it, I just, I bailed on it. So this creates some awkwardness here. <laughs> I haven't allotted 10 minutes. We're about three or four minutes in. We're both not clear that I have anything else to say, right? So, well, why don't I open it up to questions? Are there any questions on what I've done so far? I've always thought that I had an innate gift for, uh, for reading an audience. Um, so what I thought I would do, and I'm, I'm doing it already since I've been up here, I would just intuit what you are wanting me to talk about. And I can't hear from most of you, but some of you I can hear like crying out, crying out silently, but from a place deep within. David, David, you're saying, please talk to us about romance. <laughs> please give us some advice on romantic romantic love. love. Um, well, thank you very much for asking. Uh, when you own the Atlantic, you get this question all the time. Nothing says romance like a mid-19th century long-form literary magazine. So I am going to tell you about romance. Actually, that is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about romance. Let me do two administrative announcements first. This first one sounds a lot more like Vanity Fair than the Atlantic. But our e editors are experimenting with a celebrity profile for the September cover. And um, nicely for us, we have been able to um, schedule the celebrity photo shoot for here on the Aspen campus uh, this week. Um, now we get to the announcement part. We can't find the celebrity. Um, <laughs> we have been looking for the last few days. We're not finding him anywhere. There's no connection. So I thought I'd just enlist you in this. Uh, if any of you happens to meet a Mr. Bruce Jenner, would you tell him the Atlantic's looking for him? I think this is our real chance to scoop Vanity Fair. 
Second, this is, a, this is small and it's unobvious. There's an unobvious aspen angle to the drought that's developing in uh, Southern California. Um, and I say this by way of tribute to uh, Linda Resnick, who is the first citizen and most beloved person here at the Ideas Festival. Um, late last week, the Department of Defense announced uh, or issued satellite imagery showing a 2,000 mile long corridor of ocean going canoes with 5,000 shirtless men from the island of Fiji paddling water to Los Angeles. <laughs> God bless Linda Resnick. <laughs> so now I'm going to move to romance. Walter and I are um, pleased to announce that we personally are teaching the brand new romance track at this year's Ideas Festival. <laughs> We're going to be exploring what psychiatrists and neurologists and clinical scientists have discovered about the science behind falling in love. Walter is kicking off the first romance panel at Pepke at 8 o'clock tonight. It is the art of flirtation among financial leaders <laughs> with panelists Peter Orzag, Janet Yellen, and Timothy Geithner. <laughs> so I thought what I would do is just offer a quick primer on what the academic literature says about falling in love. And I'm going to leave the jocular voice for a moment. Um, so most people, a little over 80% of us, fall in love the first time when we're in our teen years. But we know a great deal by now about the cascade in the brain that follows that. So do you remember the first time you fell in love? That incomparably happy state where you don't need to sleep, you don't need anything but that love. Well, that is a clinical phenomenon. Uh, the first time you uh, fall in love, the brain releases a cocktail of hormones, serotonin, uh, dopamine, and oxytocin, which just um, bathe the brain, they suffuse the brain. You think that you have fallen in love with a particular person, but what's actually happened is you have fallen in love with the chemicals, with that <laughs> torrent, that flood of chemicals that comes in when you met that person. It could be that that would have happened with the next person, the next person, but you've attached to that person. And for most of us, the, uh, that first rush of chemicals is never equaled again across your whole lifetime. It's never induced to that level by any other relationship. So let me try a question out on you. Um, uh, the average divorce rate of first marriages in the United States is just under 50%. The average divorce rate of second marriages is about 60%. The average, of 30, average for third marriages, which begs the question, why do you bother, is, <laughs> is 80%. So there's one exception to the rule of likely divorce when you have had failed marriages. Do you know whom you can marry when you failed once or twice before, where you have the reasonable prospect of having that partner with you for the remainder of your life. Yeah. The exception is if you go back and marry somebody you once loved in your youth. There, there's a 76% marriage success rate. So here's what the science shows, that that love, that first love, um, never in fact ended. You know when you hear a song from your teen years and it's a little bit of a tug at the heart? That's the mind, not the heart, that's doing the tug. The brain first falls in love and then spends the rest of its life ceaselessly searching for that feeling all over again. Let me take you to a subspecialty of, um, of the science of romance. This is flirtation. There's actually an academic literature on flirtation. Uh, flirtation studies are generally done in the field. Researchers go out to singles bars and restaurants and um, malls, wherever people can be seen picking up other people, and they observe what are the best practices, what are the worst practices. <laughs> so let me begin with a piece of reassurance. It's typically not the most attractive person who most succeeds in this kind of flirting, this kind of picking up of people. Rather, it's the person who, and this is a term of art, signals availability. Signals availability. So you know what the two universal signs of being available are? One is smiling, and the other is making eye contact. And this sounds too awkward to be true, but it's also appealing when somebody nakedly stares at you. <laughs> uh, that has that sort of confidence of, of just looking at you. So while you're here on campus, Walter and I want to... <laughs> we want to ask you to avoid unintended eye contact. <laughs> We don't want you leading people on. And so what that means is if somebody happens to smile at you or you catch somebody's eye, you can be pretty much assured that they are showing romantic interest. 
I'm going to separate out men from women here. So here's a tip for women. Women won't be surprised from this, by this. Men love what's called mirroring. That is when the woman mirrors the posture of the man, uh, the way he's sitting, the way he's standing, the tilt of the head, the arm gestures, and so forth. Uh, men like, uh, here's tips for men. Women like two things in men. One is called space maximization. Space maximization <laughs> is where a man takes up as much room as he can. I see a little bit of it here. Um, an example is where a man puts his arm out across the, the chair beside him. Uh, another example is when men stretch both arms up above their head. The literature even talks about men who go around uh, walking around with one arm over their head like this, um, which most of us think of as a, a way to get a taxi. Um, but it is so much more than that. This is a come hither gesture to taxi drivers. And I see this only in hindsight, but it so explains the sexual tension that all of us feel on the way to LaGuardia. <laughs> Second, women are attracted uh, to what, and I'm going to quote a study here, to men who playfully shove each other around. So let's try to model this. Um, let's say David Brooks and Tony Blair are talking outside of Dor Hosier and Jane Harmon comes out of the building. And let's say David sees her first, so it's his move to playfully shove Tony Blair off the sidewalk. <laughs> Men exhibiting this beha behavior get from women what researchers call preferential treatment. So I want to lift up with a story in Dakota. About four years ago, I was asked to interview Ted Turner for the Council on Foreign Relations in an evening uh, program with about 100 people. Now, the Council is an earnest public policy-oriented group but even with an earnest public policy-oriented group, there's only one thing anyone really wants to talk about with Ted Turner. Jane Fonda, Jane Fonda right. <laughs> so I worked out three or four ways, which I thought were subtle, to move the conversation towards Jane Fonda. So that night when I came, I was introduced to Ted, who was 72 years old, and he's an old 72 years old. And he had with him a woman in her 30s who I thought was a nurse, and he introduced her. <laughs> It wasn't even humor. I actually thought, thought she was a nurse. And he introduced her as his girlfriend. And so then we're taken up to a very low stage, and the girlfriend is no more than 10 feet from us, and I just didn't have it in me to raise Jane Fonda with the girlfriend there. So sometime into the interview, Ted says to me, you know, David, I was married to Jane Fonda. And I said, I know that. Um, and he said, did you know that we were divorced? And I said, well, I knew you were separated. And he said, yes, it's been really hard on me. Uh, I have a ranch out of Montana where we used to go, and there's a master bedroom there. And then to go to the mas from the master bedroom to the bathroom, there's a long corridor, and it's open closets on either side. And all the way down the left-hand side are my clothes, and all the way down the right-hand side are Jane's clothes. Um, so after the divorce, I went back out to Montana, t to the ranch, to bring myself together. And I wasn't thinking about it, and I walked into the bedroom, then I walked into the corridor. And I looked down, and I saw all my clothes going down to the left, and it was completely empty going down the right. And I fell to my knees, and I wept. Even at 72, that's the incomparable force of romantic love. So lifting up, um, this would be a remarkable, memorable ideas festival if some number of you here, fell in love, in romantic love. <laughs> and Walter in particular wants that for you. <laughs> Walter told me he personally wants to be as helpful to you as he can doing one-on-one -on -one romance consulting and so forth. <laughs> so he asked me to encourage you, when you see Walter on the sidewalks, or just pull him aside and open up your heart. Tell him about your <laughs> early romances, tell him about your marriage, explain the infidelities, just whatever is on your heart. And you find, in the end, Walter just stares at you. He's probably flirting. <laughs> we have at the Atlantic what we call the Elizabeth Taylor School of Public Speaking. So as Elizabeth said to each of her five successive husbands, I won't be keeping you long. And now, as we kick off the festival, we've asked some of our participants to share a big idea in a small period of time to get this going.
I'm Ron Davis. I'm the CEO of Jordan Davis Foundation. My son Jordan was killed in Jacksonville, Florida at a gas station for loud music just behind the Trayvon Martin incident. And the first thing I want to say is, who scheduled me to go behind that guy? <laughs> That's like the guy that married Michael Jordan's ex-wife. How do you go behind Michael Jordan? <laughs> but anyway, uh, we have a, a new film out called Three and a Half Minutes, Ten Bullets. Uh, it is going to be here on Tuesday, and I want you all to come out here. It's about the Jordan Davis story and the Michael Dunn trial, and uh, we also got picked up by HBO, so if you don't see it, then you can see it on HBO. I had a big idea. <laughs> uh, how many of you uh, travel to at least 30 cities every year? Raise your hand, so you're going to know what I'm talking about. The planes up there, they have like lanes that they fly in. Uh, when you jump into your cab, or you jump into your Uber, or you jump into your Carmel car, they have lanes that they drive in. And as I was going through the airports, I was noticing, how come we don't have lanes at the airport, the major airports, for the people that want to walk slow <laughs> and look at all the stores? We should have like a yellow line going down the airport and a green line. So you people that fly and go to more than 30 cities a year, you'll stop knocking down these old ladies on your way to making your flights. So my big idea is have lanes in all the major airports. So if you want to go slow, go slow. If you want to go fast, you go fast. Lanes. And don't steal my idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copyright it. Don't steal my idea. Lanes in the airport is my big idea. And I just want to say also that I want to have 10 seconds of silence for the poor souls in Charleston, South Carolina, if you would give me 10 seconds of silence, please. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I was in Charleston about a week ago, and I got a chance to go into the sanctuary. And, you know, it is very spiritual. I mean, it hits you like a ton of bricks when you're in there. I lost my son, Jordan Davis, and his spirit is within me. And when I walked in there, I was bombarded with the spirits of those brave people that sat there and let someone shoot them and didn't even attack him and try to save their own lives because they believe that much in God. And I hope anybody in here would have that kind of faith in God that they could believe that they would not just sit there and allow someone to kill them because they believe that they were going to heaven. I just want to say, I just want to say that white lives matter all over this country, all over the world. But here in America today, it seems like black lives don't matter. I want to say to you, black lives matter. We want to live in the world together with you. And we will not let the white supremacists take over this world because for us in America to be America the beautiful, we have to make sure that all lives matter. Thank you very much. My name is Sherry Turkle, and I study technology and culture. And my big idea is that we face a crisis in empathy and that we can cure it with conversation. These days, we readily admit that in business and in love, we would often rather text or message or send an email than talk face to face. Why? We can control our time. We can multitask and we can have the feeling that we're getting things right. And it all adds up to a flight from conversation, at least from the kinds of conversation that's open-ended and spontaneous, 
the kinds of conversation in which we play with ideas, in which we allow ourselves to be fully present and fully vulnerable. Yet those are exactly the kinds of conversations in which empathy flourishes and intimacy flourishes. Distracted at our dinner tables, in our living rooms, at our business meetings, and in our classrooms, we find traces of a new silent spring, which is the term that Rachel Carson coined when we were ready to see that with technological change had come an assault on our environment. Now we've arrived at another moment of recognition. But this time, technology is implicated in an assault on empathy. Research shows that even a silent phone on a lunch table between two people causes them to share less with each other. In another experiment, the very presence of a phone on the periphery of a landscape, kind of in the periphery of your vision, leaves people feeling less connected to each other, less interested in each other, less empathic toward each other. So it's not surprising that in the past 20 years, we've seen a 40% decline in the markers for empathy among college students. But we're resilient. The human spirit is resilient. In one study, in only five days at a summer camp with no devices, with no electronic devices, children begin to relearn the ability to identify with the feelings of others. How do they do that? They talk to each other. Face-to-face -face conversation is the most human and the most humanizing thing that we do. So this isn't about giving up our phones. It's about using them mindfully. And when we do, conversation is there to reclaim for the failing connections of our digital age. It's the talking cure. Thank you. Hi, I'm James Bennett. I'm the uh, president and editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, and what I have is actually a little story that maybe has pieces of Ron's idea and Walter's idea about curiosity kind of mashed up in it. More than 150 years ago, The Atlantic published a gripping account of a slave rebellion that was planned in Charleston, South Carolina in 1822. A writer called it the most elaborate insurrectionary project ever formed by American slaves. Hundreds were involved, and had they not been betrayed in the 11th hour, they may well have taken the city. They were led by a um, charismatic uh, carpenter named Denmark Vesey, a man who'd bought his own freedom years earlier with, uh, for $600 from lottery winnings. At Vesey's trial, a judge expressed astonishment that a free man would risk everything. We get a clue to um, Vizi's thinking from one of his comrades who quoted him as saying that he was satisfied with his own condition being free, but as all his children were slaves, he wished to see what could be done for them. Our writer pursued this story because it had been deliberately forgotten. Though the incident took place less than 40 years before we published the piece, it had vanished completely from official histories because of what the writer called a distaste among whites for the memory of the tale. He wrote, the official reports which told what slaves had once planned and dared have now come to be among the rarest of American historical documents. Denmark Vesey was a founder and minister of Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, and Clemente Pinckney, his eventual successor, would tell people Vesey's story in hopes of reminding them of this history. As you all know, Pinckney and eight of his congregants, congregants were murdered um, this month, evidently by someone with very different notions about the past, a man longing for the old South and the old South Africa and Rhodesia. Because of those murders, we're engaged now in a debate about the true historic resonance 
of symbols of the Confederacy, a debate characterized not just by stridents or temporizing on the part of those to, who defend these symbols, but surprise on the part of many of us that those symbols are so deeply embedded in our culture. Many people find themselves asking for the first time questions like, why is it that Jefferson Davis, who tried to destroy the Union in order to perpetuate slavery, is honored with a statue under the US Capitol's dome? I think the story of this century so far, particularly for Americans, has been in many respects about our gradual, our, our too gradual awakening from a happy dream that we'd overcome our history or that somehow history had even ended. In the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, in North Africa, in the heart of Europe, in the South China Sea, and at home, we keep discovering and we keep being surprised to discover that history is far from done with us. My name is Nancy Gertner, and for 17 years I was a judge of the United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts. During those 17 years, I sentenced over 500 people to sentences of which 80%, I believe, were unfair and disproportionate. I left the bench in 2011 to join the Harvard faculty and to write and to write about those stories, and to write about how it came to pass uh, that we were, that I was, obliged to sentence people to terms that frankly made no sense under any philosophy, any theory of retribution, any theory of social change. So my big idea is that it takes a cue from the World War II, post-World War II period, from the Marshall Plan, the Marshall Plan was unique because it set out not to punish uh, those who had been defeated and sow the seeds of future rebellion and future rage, but to rebuild, to look to the future and not to the past. Another version which is not quite as successful is obviously post-Civil War Reconstruction, which as we know was not as successful, but still the idea was not to punish, but to rebuild. Well, we finished a war or we should be finishing a war. We finished a war on drugs. And although we were not remotely the victors of that war, we need a big idea in order to deal with those who were its victims. We need a plan to reconstruct neighborhoods, not countries, to be sure. We need a plan to stop punishing, as which is all that we have done in the past, uh, and to start rebuilding. What do I mean by a failed war on drugs? This is a, drug, a war that I saw destroyed lives, eliminated a generation of African-American men, covered our racism in ostensibly neutral guidelines and mandatory minimums, which were only applied or largely applied to African-American men, created an intergenerational problem Although I didn't, wasn't on the bench long enough to see this, we know that the sons and daughters of the people we sentenced are in trouble and are in trouble with the criminal justice system. Fostered domestic violence because an entire generation of men were eliminated from these communities uh, and eliminated, fundamentally eliminated their political participation. Again, we were not destroying cities as we did in leveling cities as we did in World War II with bombs but with prosecution, prisons, and punishment. My Marshall Plan, my book, my effort to reconstruct the lives that I had a role in undermining is this. First, there's the Gertner Clemency Project. I'm trying to go through my list of people to see who deserves the, the president's clemency. But then we need a Marshall Plan that would be physical, deal with release from prison, that will be economic, rebuild these communities, that will be psychological, deal with the harms that we've created, and that will be political, to restore political participation. The impact of the criminal justice system that I presided over in my small way was systemic. Our response to it has to be systemic. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm Philippe Cousteau, and I'm an environmental advocate and filmmaker. And I believe that in order to solve the grave social and environmental problems that we face in the 21st century, we need drastic change. Since the Industrial Revolution, our society has been doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And that, my friends, as we all know, is the definition of insanity. See, unless we shift the way we think about our entire economic system, we will be unable to build the world that we all desperately seek. Unfortunately, those tasked with solving the problems of our society, uh, nonprofit movement in particular, while valuable, is unable to do so. Consider that annual charitable giving in the United States is about $300 billion, and yet U.S. financial markets are worth $38 trillion. The fundamental failure of our 20th century economic model is that all too often human and environmental capital is destroyed in the pursuit of ever faster financial growth. This cannot continue. While there is some good news, sustainable investment movement has grown to about six and a half trillion dollars. That growth is not fast enough. A survival of people and the planet depends on a wholesale realignment of our economic system and the rapid growth of companies that enhance human and environmental capital whilst still driving economic growth. So my idea is very specific. It is to eliminate capital gains for five years on all impact investments in the United States, thus accelerating capital flows to the companies that will build a sustainable economy for the 21st century. My father always said we must build a world where every single child has the right to breathe fresh air, drink clean water, walk under green grass, under a blue sky. And ladies and gentlemen, if we do not act and act quickly, then that world will disappear for all of us. But we can turn it around. Thank you. I'm here today to tell you about the incredible things that happen to children and adult lives when we open mathematics. I am a Stanford professor of mathematics education and the founder of UCubed. So we have a math crisis in this country. Children everywhere are failing. Inequities are widespread. Why? Because math classrooms are boring, procedural, rote learning calculations. Just as bad, we tell children all the time that they can't do well in math. But real math is visual, creating, exciting, and accessible. So at UCubed, we're teaching the world of teachers and parents how to open up math. We're also teaching the incredible new brain science that's so important for math. And I want to share three things from that today. Uh, first, everyone can learn math. All the evidence is showing us that brains can grow and change. Second, mistakes in math grow your brain. And the most important learning opportunities are when we're struggling, when we're making mistakes, when things are hard. And third, and this is pretty amazing, the beliefs we hold about ourselves, whether we believe we can do something, actually change the mathematical working of our brains. We need to transform math classrooms and the messages given to kids. The good news is it's easy to open up math, and I'm going to give you two examples. First, a standard math class question in classrooms everywhere is find the area of an 8 by 3 rectangle. What do you do? Students perform a calculation, 8 times 3. Or we open it up and we say, see how many rectangles you can find with an area of 24. When we do that, kids' eyes light up. They're trying to find things. They're investigating. They make drawings. They're connecting uh, proportions of length and width. It's amazing. Another example we can give, you can ask kids one divided by two thirds. What will they do? They'll struggle. They'll try and flip. Uh, they'll do procedures. They'll get confused. Or we can say to them, find the answer to one divided by two thirds and prove it visually. When that happens, everything changes. In my math classes at Stanford, I, I say to students, show me the most creative representation you can give me of these mathematical ideas, and you would be blown away by what they produce. Children and adults are inspired when we open math and we invite thinking and creativity. We can do this. We've had over a million hits on our website in the last six months. Parents and teachers are excited. If we open math in classrooms, we will inspire millions more students and teachers. So please come and join our math revolution.
My name is Gregory Mosier, and I direct plays. And our idea, perhaps big, perhaps modest, certainly curious, is to engage a play that's been part of Aspen since its earliest days, Sophocles' Antigone, by taking it to some of the most stressed places on the planet. One week from today, a young international company will be in the Kibera slum, one of the largest slums in Africa, in Nairobi. And we'll be performing for young girls, really, in a bare space with only Sophocles' idea. We're going to move on to schools, prisons, the townships of Johannesburg and Cape Town to find out what this play means to these young people, a play that presents irreconcilable conflicts, or seemingly irreconcilable conflicts, between the young and old, the needs of the living and the needs of the dead, the individual's conscience, and the demands of the state. And above all, probably, the empowerment of women, men and women, Creon and Antigone. You will remember, most of you, that in this play, there's been a civil war. Antigone's two brothers, have killed each other in battle. The loyal brother, Ateocles, is to receive a state funeral with all honors, while the rebel brother, Polynices, who came armed against Thebes, will be left, according to Creon, where he fell to be eaten by the birds and dogs. Antigone goes under the cover of a mysterious dust storm to perform a brief ceremonial burial of the traitorous brother. And she's caught. And she's brought before Creon and before you, the people of Thebes. And he says, you, with your face on the ground, do you say you did it? Are you, or do you deny this act? I say I did it, and I don't deny it. Well, tell me then. No speeches now. Did you know I'd made a law against this very act? How could I not? It was explicit. And yet you dared to break it. Yesterday you made this law. You'll make another one tomorrow. But the fixed, unwritten laws of heaven are outside time. We don't know where they came from, nor can we know. Should I risk punishment for breaking them because I feared a mortal's thought? You say I will die. I don't need you to tell me that's my fate. I've always known this, even as a child. When you live with as many evils as I do, to die before my time is not the worst thing. I have no sadness for this destiny. Sadness would be to leave my brother's son without a grave. If this seemed foolish to you, find a fool to judge. She thinks she's smart to muddy up the laws. She boasts she breaks them. But I am not a man. No, she's the man if her audacity goes unpunished. I don't care that she's my sister's child. She will die the death I have decreed. I hate when someone's caught attempting bad and then pretends it's beautiful. You seem to want more than my death. No, girl. If I have that, I have it all. Then stop talking if your words displease me. Yours displease me and others, though they will not say. Don't you see that no one's with you? They are with me, but their tongues are numb with fear. They're not. Aren't you ashamed to stand alone? There was no shame in honoring my own flesh and blood. Another of your flesh died fighting for his homeland. We are all of the same flesh. Same man, same wife. Yet you honored the godless one. It is not for you to say who is godless and who is not. It's clear enough to everyone but you. He was my brother. And he attacked. The death world asks that we perform these rites. But only for the good. Great king, I do not hate as you do. I live to love. Then love in hell. No woman rules my life.
Hi, my name is Nina Khrushcheva. I teach international affairs at the New School. And my big idea is about selling the idea that intellect is a virtue. As Larry the Cable Guy once said, <laughs> in America, we don't only make things you want, we make things you don't know you want. So let's not complain that consumer culture kills knowledge in our soundbite society. Let's make people want to be intellectual. Use America's best advertisement to make high culture trendy. McDonald's Happy Meal includes Disney toys. Why not book characters? Three Musketeers, Anna Karenina, Jane Eyre. I am particularly fond of Ulysses, be it Homer's or James Joyce's. If Madison Avenue can sell Betty Crocker powder cakes, selling an intellectual lifestyle as fashion is a piece of cake. <laughs> Globally, America barely scores in top 20 in math and reading, but China is number one. During the Cold War 1950s and 60s, when the high-cultured Soviet Union was beating United States in space, John F. Kennedy called to explore the stars to encourage the arts. In 1969, an American landed on the moon. Here is the idea that actually comes from China, where being smart is popular. You walk into a shopping mall and see William Faulkner's novels sticking out of Tory Burch's handbags. <laughs> high fashion, high culture. Russia, which reads a lot, has success with literature-themed restaurants. Some are gloomy, like Dostoevsky, but still. So let's have a James Baldwin cafe chain. And turning to music, a countrywide Giuseppe Verdi lounge with La Traviata happy, well, unhappy, hour. You'd say it trivializes classics, perhaps. But even the trivialized classics are better than no classics at all. Thank you. My name is Melody Barnes, and I'm chair of the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions. I, thank you. America is in love with the transformational leader. America must fall in love with leadership. What's the difference? Dr. Jonas Salk is widely and appropriately credited with discovering the vaccine for polio. But there were hundreds of individuals who also contributed to that accomplishment. There were the scientists and the lab workers. There was the organization that's now known as the March of Dimes that galvanized public support and the resources that actually created the lab to make the work possible. And there were the parents and there were the children who took that first vaccine. Leadership is widely distributed. We need individuals who know themselves well enough to work effectively with others, to create a shared vision, and to take action with others to achieve results. We've heard about those kinds of leaders and that kind of leadership today parents in communities taking action to push back against violence. We saw it this past week with those who've gathered in communities decade after decade after decade to make the gay marriage decision possible. We're doing that kind of work at Aspen as well, with young leaders all over the country, urban, rural, tribal communities, who are not only exercising their own leadership to transform their lives, but to transform their communities. And I'm also doing this work at NYU with our leadership initiative and developing and cultivating and supporting young leaders all over the globe. We have to remember that those who are leaders are not always leading, and those who are leading are not always the leader. I'm Kathy Sullivan. I'm the head of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And I want to place the Earth in the palm of your hands. 
As an astronaut, I had the great fortune of being able to see our planet from my office window and marvel at its dynamically integrated system. These magical moments forged a deep appreciation for the uniqueness of our planet and the vital importance of understanding it from a comprehensive and inclusive perspective. One ocean, one atmosphere, one singular system of systems called Earth. Until today, this sense of our home planet has largely been restricted to those of us that had that great privilege to float in space and seemingly hold our planet in the palm of our hands. What if tomorrow you had this too? What if new renderings of environmental insights would do away with mere maps of our planet's skin and allow you to understand the Earth and its inextricably interwoven systems as a whole? Suppose we transformed the terabytes of data we collect every day from satellites and sensors in the ocean, on land and in the atmosphere, into a completely new understanding of our surroundings and a radically new generation of forecasts. And suppose that we put that holistic understanding into the palm of your hand and put reliable prediction, foresight, right at your fingertips. My vision is grounded in a data revolution that promises to make the huge store of data we scientists have gathered over decades not only accessible, but ubiquitous. Just think how this could revolutionize our capacity to make decisions, better decisions, ones that factor in the dynamic environment we live in, ones that at last take proper account of our planet. Imagine long-term water forecasts that let the family farmer and the big ag grower, not to mention the water manager in California right now today, anticipate drought and know months ahead how much rain they'll get and when. Or coastal ocean forecasts of real time wind and wave, tide and current and navigational data at the fingertips of the leisure boater and the commercial shipping captain, allowing them to maximize both cargo loads and safety as they chart their courses. Or street level flood outlooks days before a hurricane comes in that allow coastal residents and public emergency managers to determine when they need to get out of harm's way. Knowledge is power is a well-worn truism. I'm talking about environmental intelligence, reliable, timely information that gives us foresight about changing environmental conditions. This is invaluable on the very dynamic planet we inhabit. So let's harness the capability of Earth observations, data, and innovation to infuse this more fully into the decisions made on Main Street and Wall Street and in capitals across the globe. Let's arm our businesses, our communities, and our citizens with the foresight we need to live wisely and well on this planet for centuries to come. And let's commit ourselves to using this new capacity to take proper account of our planet and all our actions and economic decisions. It's time for you to have Earth in the palm of your hands as well. Hello, I'm Phyllis Taylor from New Orleans and chairman of the Patrick F. Taylor Foundation. And my big idea came from attending the Aspen Ideas Festival. It was after Katrina. Many thought our city would never come back. But 200 years ago this year, an unlikely group fought the Battle of New Orleans. It was a combination of pirates, regular militia, volunteers, Native Americans, free men of color. And at the end, British colonialism was gone from America. We could, we would rebuild. Tulane University quickly moved in, developed community clinics, entrepreneurial training, mandatory community service. Here in Aspen, I kept hearing about social innovation, design thinking. Why not put that in the Tulane mix? Today, there is such a center at Tulane. So my big idea, approach issues such as water, energy, coastal restoration, healthcare, crime, homelessness, education, and everything else, and bring it together with the schools of architecture, business, law, medicine, public health and tropical medicine, social work, science and engineering, 
the primate center, and let's not forget the College of Liberal Arts. And then engage the community that daily faces these issues. Find out what doesn't work, and then try to find out what will work. Create products, programs, and practices that solve these issues with another very unlikely combination of people, bringing to everyone life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to the people of New Orleans, to our nation, and to our world. In other words, New Orleans is the test ground, and we would have the second battle of New Orleans. Since its inception, the Aspen Ideas Festival has actively pursued participation by young emerging leaders from across the globe. Our objectives are plain, to engage the next generation of thinkers and doers in the discussion of important ideas, and to inspire the rest of us to even higher ideals. My name is Eric Dawson, I'm the president of Peace First, and we work around the globe teaching young children the skills of peacemaking. What has stayed with me the most about the Aspen Ideas Fest and getting to be a part of such a great community were the people that I got to meet. I found people engaging, found people kind and open, and it was an unbelievable experience. Hi, my name is Kiana Elliott, and I'm a third year student at the University of Florida studying horticultural science. At the Aspen Ideas Festival, there was one session that struck me the most. This session was the Feed Nine Billion session in which I got to hear people like Lauren Bush discuss how they're helping to address feeding our population. This session was profound for me because it really made me think about my own desire to help address this issue. Hello everyone, my name is Atik Bissous. I'm currently acting as the Financial Advisory Service Coordinator for Wood Capital in Haiti. My favorite session was Resident Dividend, animated by Ms. Judith Warden. After the session, it became clear to me that disruption is going to be part of life. And when disaster struck, you have to stay strong and try to build back better and stronger. My name is Shadi Salehi. I am Managing Director of Distribution and Audience Development at ITVS. Being at the Aspen Ideas Festival was so surreal and such a privilege. It was such an amazing space. It was such an honor to be in that environment and I will never forget it. It was probably one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. Thanks to the generous support of our Ideas Festival patrons, we now offer 300 remarkable leaders from all over the U.S. and beyond opportunities to attend this event across these 10 days. This is an exciting time to be addressing serious issues, and we are confident these individuals will leave the festival even more prepared and inspired to take on the challenges of our time. I'm Vlad Boykulescu, coming from Romania, Eastern Europe. My name's Jeffrey Harrell, and I'm an Air Force Academy cadet and an Air Force Jump Master on the Wings of Blue. My name is Angelica Perez Lidwin. I'm from New York City, and I'm the founder of Latinas Think Big. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Sylvester Mwanza. I am from Zambia. Hi, I'm Ivar Soum. I'm the CEO of Dr. Bridge Healthcare IT company in Egypt. Hi, my name is Kristen Ferguson. I work on strategic relations for education at the U.S. Green Building Council. I am Connor Landgraf. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Echo, and I'm from Berkeley, California. Minglava. My name is Tanya Shankai, and you can call me Shankai. Hey, I'm Nathan LaBrasser. I'm in Rochester, Minnesota, where I'm an associate professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic. Hi, my name is Tyler Green. I am the producer and host of the Modern Art Notes podcast. Hi, I'm Sandra Balaban. I am from Brooklyn, New York, and I am the founder and director of City Pathways. I am so looking forward to being an Aspen Ideas Scholar this summer. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm always embarrassed to introduce myself uh, because when I do, I, I get overwhelmed. Um, but my name is Kitty Boone, and I have got the honor. I have the honor of working with a team of unbelievable people who help us put on this event, and uh, we couldn't do it without all the kids 
that work for the Aspen Institute. And it's a pleasure to introduce them to you over the week, and you'll see them a lot. And I won't go into all their names right now. Um, I would like to invite all of our scholars that you just saw some of to stand up. And welcome them to the Ideas Festival. And I would also like to uh, invite the Bezos scholars and the Aspen Challenge students from Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and Denver to stand up. And the African Leadership Academy as well. Our promise around youth engagement start partly from being able to host these youth for so many years thanks to the generosity and passion and commitment of Mike and Jackie Bezos and the Bezos Family Foundation. We are launching this fall a youth engagement initiative at the very highest echelon of the Aspen Institute and we're really excited about it and it's you guys that have gotten us to that point. So I'm really excited to, uh, to share that with you. I'd like to take a moment to um, thank our underwriters who are offering remarkably innovative exhibits, technologies, and immersive experiences this week for all of you to take advantage of. We wouldn't be here tonight without them and their support. I thank you and we all thank you. Their <laughs> logos are everywhere. It's a little bit of a hard act to follow what we just heard, and I, um, I'm not prepared to remark on what we just heard, but I think this was, Graham, the most fantastic opening we have ever had, and I cannot thank you enough. I have to do a little housekeeping, and then we'll get to some stuff. If you don't wear this, you don't get in. Your security and the security of our presenters is really at stake, so please do wear your badges. If you don't have one, go to our registration desk. We'll give you a day pass and come with it tomorrow. Um, we have a terrific lineup of events in town and, well, and on our campus at night. If you don't think you can get in because something is sold out, just go to the door. We, we will get you in. I might not be at the door. <laughs> Uh, parking may not be as easy as it has been in the past. It's probably never been that easy. But we have a tremendous number of shuttles going on a regular basis, back and forth from town. And we have a wonderful relationship with WeCycle, which is a free bike ride that you've been offered through your registration. And I highly recommend you use it. And then I need to talk to you about our app. Because already today, you have an agenda that there are some things that are a little bit out of date. We will do everything we can to communicate all uh, agenda changes. Our app and our website at uh, aspenideas.org are always updated. And you'll see those updates on screens. Go to sessions. We'll inform you as much as we can of changes. But uh, do use the app, which you can download at aspenideas.org. And you can see why this is like not really as inspiring a great idea as some of the things you <laughs> already heard. But for the fun stuff. In 2015, we are championing wicked problems. So if we can put a slide up, I'm gonna let you try one. This one is a brain teaser from Jordan Ellenberg, who you will see this week, who claims that this, is, this one is hundreds of years old. I have a bead, which is a sphere with a cylindrical hole punched down the middle of it. The cylinder is one centimeter long. What is the volume of the bead? No, I don't have the answer. I have no idea what the answer is. I tried, but I was. Jordan does. Um, and tomorrow and every day, you're going to be offered new brain teasers. And the answers are in our bookstore, which is next to the health club. In our eagerness to create new programming and new events to offer our guests, we've planned what we think are interesting and stimulating new activities uh, across the week. For starters, you're going to see in your program guide the I. We started this two years ago. Our Bucky Fuller Dome, right over there, has been converted into a planetarium. And we have 20 and 30 minute uh, shows 
all day long and free ones at night for the public. I highly recommend you take advantage of it. We decided we wanted to distinguish ourselves by giving many of you an opportunity to meet uh, with speakers in, in intimate situations. So we created roundtable lunches. Again, they're packed, but go. Uh, we never know if people will really decide to do something else. Uh, those are uh, tomorrow and uh, the following day. Um, every afternoon at 4 o'clock, you heard Joe Bowler talk about this, we decided that you can learn anything. So we have, no matter, and we made that commitment no matter what age. I'm not going to try to replicate what Joe said so eloquently. But guess what? You can leave the Ide Ideas Festival having learned to code. You can leave the Ideas Festival having learned to play an instrument or read Shakespeare or improvise. We have people from Second City in Chicago to teach you how to improvise. Um, this is just a sampling, but you can learn all about pot. Uh, you're all aware that Col Colorado is pot legal, uh, and we have a sold-out tour, but, you know, go stand in line, a lot of people did ye yesterday, uh, of the Marijuana Grow House, which is a 50,000 square foot facility down Valley. Uh, and you have to have your driver's license, as a reminder, to be able to go, that's law, um, and no, this is not a tasting. <laughs> but it's a great way to understand uh, a brand new industry in its nascency. Um, as ever, we celebrate the arts this summer, and you just saw a spectacular example of that, uh, thanks to our robust artisan residence program. Terrific ex discussions, but also exhibits. Uh, do explore a very moving, sometimes startling uh, show staged by New Orleans curator Jonathan Ferreira, Guns in the Hands of Artists, an exploration of guns and, societies in, and society by artists using decommissioned guns to bring to our understanding what these mean in our life. These uh, exhibits are in the Heinz Room and the Pepke Gallery. There will be tours every afternoon. Look out for eyes right over there and faces that will crop out around campus. Some of them might be yours. Our artists in residence this year are stunning examples of individuals bringing art to life in new ways. Tomorrow, French street artist JR, a TED Prize winning and most recently acclaimed artist and most recently acclaimed for his study of immigrants on Ellis Island, will share images of imagination in a rather stunning performance with last year's artist Lil Buck. On Tuesday afternoon, a rather extraordinary music musician, Cameron Carpenter, will be in this room Join and uh, join us for that conversation and performance. And later in the week, Academy Award winner Goldie Hawn will share her views on mindfulness. Our Harman Eisner Artist in Residency Program and all of our arts programs couldn't be offered without the amazing support of Michael Eisner and Jane Harmon. And we also thank additional donors comprising our artist circle. You all are amazing. Thank you for allowing the Aspen Institute and the Atlantic to raise arts to a national discussion. <laughs> Finally, a word about this year's programming. For starters, we've added a new format each day. It is a deep dive. It's a 90-minute session, multiple parts, multiple perspectives. I think it'll be very interesting. Tomorrow, we launch with a session about fisheries and the drought. The next day, we're going to talk about violence in America, and we're going to talk about why math is important, and no, that's not an easy answer. And we're going to talk about jobs for our, our nation's youth. Our hope is that you will come away with a deeper appreciation for a variety of issues. And will you, will you let us know if you like the format, because it's an experiment? It worked really well last couple of days. Please tell us. Please give us feedback. Um, finally, we're examining program topics that might be slightly unnerving, maybe even scary. Sorry, Joe, but especially if you are, like me, afraid to death of the idea, much less the word math. I have to say, we have the most remarkable group of mathematicians in the United States gathering on our campus this week. Don't miss any of it. Uh, it's really an honor to host all of you on our campus. And thank you so much for being here.
Additional topics are no easier to tackle, but our hope is that you will attend these sessions with open minds and hearts as we explore the very complicated issues of inequality in America, of violence on our streets, of the oceans at risk, of challenges to our democracy at home and abroad. You got a taste of this this afternoon. Maybe we can all embrace the opinions and concerns which our presenters offer, as well as the remarkable solutions that they will share. Our theme, Wicked Problems, Smart Solutions, is intentional. We hope to tackle the toughest problems and then inspire with the smartest ideas to solve them. And speaking of the smartest ideas, just yesterday we offered at Spotlight Health our first ever award funding to a speaker or scholar with us this week whose unique ideas had won them a place on our stage as a, final, a finalist uh, at our inaugural, uh, inaugural Aspen Ideas Award competition. On June 30th, five more will take the stage. On July 3rd, five more will take the stage. We encourage you to attend and vote for the individuals whose ideas we should put in motion. Our first time offering the Aspen Ideas Award, a project we work together on with uh, our wonderful colleagues at Booz Allen Hamilton. Our goal is to support the growth and implementation of a great idea. Yesterday, Copano Mabasso from South Africa won $25,000 for winning hearts uh, over her hope to offer better maternal health, uh, maternal health services excuse me, to women in distant rural communities of sub-Saharan Africa. On Tuesday, who knows? But we know this, you can influence the outcome and place an idea into action. And we were also really thrilled that somebody in our audience decided that all the other finalists should receive some funding support and we got a grant for $60,000 to spread across all of our finalists. So right here, right at the Aspen Ideas Festival, we seek to offer seeds of contemplation and inspiration. Do go to sessions you know nothing about. Share these ideas and discussions with family, friends, and acquaintances, be it around the dinner table, or through written or tweeted letters to others. And most of all, have a wonderful time, because after all, it is a festival. Let the games begin. Yeah. Thank you.